Well, the time is just going to seven minutes past eight. Yes, we welcome you back to Wednesday night with myself, Inayat Wadi. And uh, the second part of the show is going to be dedicated uh, uh, entirely on uh, the state of uh, South African SOEs, uh, ESCOM in particular. And the question we are begging this evening is, are we looking at a next Zimbabwean situation in South Africa? Are we looking at another Venezuela? Now, we've assembled a panel this evening. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Rutendo Matinyarari, uh, Zimbabwean anti-sections movement. We've got Dr. Dale McKinley, uh, international political economist. And uh, shortly, we also will be joined uh, by Papano Pasha with the Anti-Poverty Forum. And uh, two of my guests are on screen right now as we welcome our listeners, our viewers on Salam Media on Wednesday nights with myself, Inayat Wadi. You can view us uh, on the various platforms of Salam Media, on our YouTube channel, uh, on the social media pages as well, and also on the other audio channels that uh, we reach out and broadcast to you. We welcome you and great having you in our company. But right now, going across to our guests, uh, uh, Rotendo Matinyarari, uh, good evening to you and welcome to the show. Thank you so much uh, for bringing me onto the show. Yes, and also to Dr. Dale McKinley, uh, thank you for your time with us. We do appreciate you taking time out and talking to us. Thank you, Inayet, and uh, my apologies for having to leave early. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I'd like to actually start off with you, uh, Dr. Dale, because uh, you have to leave early and uh, just looking at where we are at this point in time. And uh, clearly, uh, the signs are not good. Uh, many are prophets of doom are predicting dark clouds hanging over the country uh looking at uh escom looking at the soes and uh the concern is uh, are we fast getting to a state uh, of failed state and are we looking at another zimbabwe or a venezuela emerging in south africa well i i don't i'm, I'm not convinced that the uh, comparisons are, are particularly accurate um for a number of different reasons we have our problems. We have big problems in South Africa. Uh, there have clearly been mismanagement. There's been corruption. Uh, there's been lack of planning. Uh, there's been a whole range of, of uh, you know, wrong decisions or, or lack of, of leadership, uh, all the way stretching back to the, to the uh, mid to late 1990s when it became very clear and when a, a position paper was done that said to ESCOM that within 10 years they were going to basically... Uh, the demand was going to outstrip supply. They needed to begin to plan, begin to, to expand the grid, uh, find new forms of, of alternative uh, sources. And this was never done. So we are sitting on a 20, 25 year uh, result of, of, of that. But what's different about South Africa in terms of Zimbabwe and Venezuela is that South Africa has a huge amount of, of fairly sophisticated industrial infrastructure. Uh, it is a it is a, a very well developed economy. Largely, uh, there is a large large skills base here. The question, as far as I'm concerned, and the fundamental issue is political. It's politics. It's political will. It's political um, interference. It's entrepreneurship. It's uh, messing around with putting people into positions that um, basically have no have no purpose of being there. Who don't really aren't skilled enough and capable enough to do the job. Um, so it's not a question of, of that we are a failed state. It's not, a, it's not an a issue that we do not have the capacity. It's a question of, for me, uh, the fact that the ruling party, the ANC, has fundamentally mismanaged ESCOM uh, and has, has taken it down a road, a particular road, uh, that has, uh, ironically, of course, uh, is hitting the poor the hardest, uh, who, of course, is the historical constituency of the ANC. Um, so in my estimation, uh, that's where the problem lies. The problem lies in political decision making, management of state owned enterprises. I mean, we could talk for the entire night about other state owned enterprises, but ESCOM at the moment is the one that uh, I think is catching everyone's attention and uh, needs to be sorted out as soon as possible. Well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Dale. And, uh... Uh, just to bring in uh, Rotendo into the discussion. Now, Rotendo, I know you've got a completely different view and a completely different take on what is happening. And again, uh, looking at uh, a country like Zimbabwe, and uh, you know, we're talking about are we heading for another uh, to, or towards another Zimbabwean crisis? But there are many lessons that uh, we can actually take 
from what has happened in Zimbabwe and also uh, some of the uh, historical uh, uh, facts that actually come to the fore and one needs to look at that history to understand why we are sitting in this current uh, uh, situation and the current crisis. I think, um, first of all, I differ with the characterization of Zimbabwe being a failed state. And the reason I say that is that when you look at simple metrics, the murder rate in South Africa is the highest in Africa. It's higher than Zimbabwe. The poverty rate in South Africa is higher than that in Zimbabwe. We have a situation where 92% of the economy of South Africa is in the hands of whites and uh, uh, um, the other races, uh, Indians and uh, Chinese whilst uh, black people only control 7% of the uh, economy. And when you look at that at the GDP per capita, the South African black population, 55 million people, have a lower GDP uh, per income than Zimbabwe. While Zimbabwe has got more skills, hence a lot of skills are actually being recruited from Zimbabwe into South Africa. So the concept that there's a lot of skill in South Africa for the industrialized country that South Africa is, is not true because they're getting a lot of that labor through other countries through uh, recruitment uh, projects that uh, include uh, the homecoming revolution. So we need to put that in context. So Zimbabwe is not a failed state when we look at those metrics and those parameters. And right now we're looking at a situation where Zimbabwe is actually handling its crisis with electricity better than South Africa, because almost everybody has got solar, almost everybody is able to survive off the grid, unlike South Africa that's unable to cope with the grid collapsing. And we see the, the problem in South Africa is only going to get worse. But what we need to look at is what is the cause of the situation. We hear this talk of uh, corruption, but where is the corruption coming from? I believe that the corruption is actually coming from the people that want ESCOM privatized. It is a deliberate effort to try and deindustrialize uh, South Africa with the taking away of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises that used to be owned by the apartheid government. We saw it when SASO was privatized. We saw it when uh, ISCO was privatized. We saw it when uh, Re um, uh, Rain Freight was privatized and SAS Marine and a whole lot of other institutions that have been privatized because of an intention by the private capital that's in South Africa, which is a predominantly white private capital, a predominantly apartheid-esque uh, private capital that perpetuated the crime against humanity that wants to deprive the current government from the ability to have industry in order for it to have state control of this economy or a mixed economy so we are seeing a transition to try and bring this economy under the control of monopoly capital in total without any government interference or without any government interest in there so it's a deindustrialization uh, deindustrialization agenda that we saw in Zimbabwe that's playing itself in South Africa. But what is the problem is this? When we go back to 1910 and we had the uh, creation of the uh, Power Act, the Power Act... Attendo, can I just uh, stop you uh, for a minute? Uh, because Dale has got limited time. Uh, I just want to... I know he's got to leave in a few minutes and then uh, you and I can actually engage in a lot more detail. So I'd just like to bring uh, Dale uh, into the uh, discussion uh, once again, uh, Dale, uh, you still with us? No, I think Dale uh, McKinley has uh, disappeared. Uh, sorry about that, Rotendo. And we are creating a whole of uh, uh, Papana Pasha. I see I've just got a message uh, from uh, Dale McKinley saying load shedding just kicked in and I got cut off. Hope the program goes well. So we are talking about ESCOM and uh, sadly the lights have got out for Dale. But uh, Rotendo, just to uh, continue, and uh, we are going to get Papano Pasha uh, coming up. And, you know, you mentioned a number of issues. And when one looks at uh, uh, how uh, this entire uh, ESCOM uh, debacle has been analyzed uh, over a period of time, uh, started off with corruption. We've heard about the, uh, the State Capture Commission. A lot had basically come out in the State Capture Commission. But uh, we see a moving uh, goalpost, a moving target all the time, because uh, the excuses are just multiplying. Uh, the latest we hear about things like sabotage and lack of diesel. Now, these are goalposts that have been shifting all the time. And at the same time, we are not seeing the end to the crisis. And this is where I'm saying you have a different view. You are talking about sabotage of another sort. And uh, perhaps, you know, you would like to go back to 1910 that you're speaking about about and how things have actually evolved and looking at ESCOM, its creation over a period of time and what has happened since. Yes, so I was giving reference to the issue of uh, the, 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 the Transvaal government actually holding a commission of inquiry 
that was held specifically because of private monopolies that existed. And those private monopolies had actually merged into one private monopoly that was actually controlled by the British South Africa company. So this was a merger of what was called the Rand Mines Power Services Company and the Victoria Falls Power uh, Company. Now, the Victoria Falls Power Company was owned by the British South Africa Company, whereas uh, the uh, 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 Rand Mines uh, Power Supply Company was actually owned by the Alfred Bait and uh, 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 Vauna um, Group that was part and parcel of the Rand Lords, who were part and parcel of uh, uh, this alliance with Cecil John Rhodes in controlling South African mining. Now, they then merged and then began to be owned by the Victoria Falls uh, Power Supply Company that was owned by British South Africa Company that became a monopoly all on its own. But within this period, the Transvaal uh, government realized that a monopoly had been created. They realized the particular problems that could come with a monopoly that belonged to the English that had just defeated the Boers to control South Africa. So they decided to hold a commission. And then this commission made a determination that they felt that the power of generating electricity was a need for the development of the country and should be vested in the power in the hands of the government. But the difference is they didn't have the capacity to develop all the infrastructure they needed. They didn't have the capital to develop the infrastructure, but they needed the gold mines that were generating all the wealth in this country to generate this income through the banking facilities that would be given, underpinned by the resources of the country. So they created a law to try and give themselves a bit of control. This law that they created was the Power Act. Now, the Power Act actually started making the Transvaal government that then became the Federation of South Africa start talking about nationalizing these assets. But they feared talking about nationalization upfront because they still wanted to develop the infrastructure of South Africa. So they agreed that they're going to give the private owners an opportunity to own and to finance the creation of power generation as a monopoly that this uh, uh, Victoria Falls company was to a certain point. After 30 years, they say that we will then nationalize. But then they agreed with a compromise to then take my, uh, these, these facilities after 42 years. Now, what is interesting is that they say that nationalization was important. And even before the 42 years, if the power suppliers would not supply enough power, if they would not serve the national interest of South Africa, then the government of South Africa would have the opportunity or the right to actually expropriate or to nationalize those facilities. So there was a clear understanding that private ownership does not necessarily coincide with national interest and does not necessarily provide what a nation needs. Now, we've then fast-tracked 10 years later. The private sector has not created enough uh, uh, power generation facilities because they've just provided enough to provide electricity in Johannesburg where they're mining. But the agenda of the South African government was to industrialize the whole of South Africa, to have the steel industry come in, so they needed more power. So then they created a new act in 1922, this is when they created the uh, Electricity Act. The Electricity Act was created specifically to bring a company that was called ESCOM, or the, uh, the, the what you call it, the Electricity uh, Supply Commission. This Electricity Supply Commission was created specifically to then come in and start giving the government, even before the 42 years, an ability to have a company that could create electricity to electrify the railway system of South Africa, to allow the creation of a steel industry and more industry, and to allow the electrification of the entire South Africa. That's how ESCOM got created. And in 1923, it started planning the building of its own uh, infrastructure uh, to generate electricity because they realized they cannot uh, depend on the supply of the private companies. The private companies are about profiteering and they don't care about the majority and the people and the national development agenda. Now, my problem is we're going backwards now. We are now in 2023. There is talk of having private players coming in to generate electricity. And this goes contrary to what got the creation of a monopoly as a private entity in the beginning, which was the need to consolidate power players so that they can be uh, 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 they can be um, um, sustainable and efficient production of energy and so that they can be players who can come in and invest and they can make money at a level that would be at an economies of scale that will allow the electricity price to be affordable. Now we're going back 
to having few players who don't have economies of scale, many players that are going to make electricity expensive, that are going to make it costly, and that's going to make it difficult for the common person in South Africa to get electricity, which goes contrary to the whole reason why we had the Power Act created and the Electricity Act that in, in, that, that, that had the national government or, or, or the uh, government of South Africa during that period wanting to ensure that there's going to be generation of cheap electricity for every South African to have, or at least the white South Africans to have, for a better functional industrialized country. Now, the model they want to take now will deindustrialize South Africa. It will make it difficult for electricity to be cheap and it will make it difficult for industry to be able to function. And the only beneficiaries of that will be the monopolies that will be created. So this is why I don't think this, this issue yeah. of ESCOM can be defined only on a corruption basis when we can actually tell that there's an intention to break up what was created to give everybody electricity into something that's going to give only a few people an advantage, and that's the private companies that are going to come in. Well, Rutendo, thank you very much for unpacking that. And we'd like to bring uh, Papano Pasha uh, into the uh, discussion uh, I see on screen. Papano, if you could unmute your mic, please. Uh, and uh, good evening and welcome. Um, evening, uh, colleagues. Um, I apologize. I had network issues. Well, uh, you know, we are getting quite used to it. But Papano, you know, in fact, uh, Rotendo uh, painted a very detailed picture, uh, giving some historical perspective and context into ESCOM, the creation of uh, ESCOM as well. And uh, looking at uh, where we are at this point in time, and I know you've got a huge uh, interest in uh, the subject you yourself have written extensively uh, looking at ESCOM, not only from a corruption perspective, but a lot more. And uh, I see in Rotendo touch on a number of issues, uh, looking at corporates, looking at corporate interests, looking at industrialization or deindustrialization in uh, South Africa. And again, you know, we are talking about being at the mercy of the big players, uh, massive players. And I know you've looked at you know white monopoly capital you've looked at the the likes of anglo-american you've looked at the like of uh, the ruperts and you've spoken extensively now look, taking all of that and putting that into context just your thoughts and uh, you know in terms of how you see uh, things have evolved over a period of time at escom soes in general and how this has led to our crisis uh, no, thank you uh, so much, Inyat, and evening to your listeners and those who are watching. Well, I find it uh, very interesting because what we are mainly seeing now is that uh, the same corporates um, or corporations which have benefited uh, from the ANC-led government are now changing the narrative um, of what is happening um, with the ruling party, characterizing it as corrupt despite the benefits or the beneficiation that... Um, they've gotten uh, through the years. But for me, what's, what's quite interesting, and Rutanda, I think, touched on a bit of history of um, the originations of, of ESCOM. But I think it's important to also look at how capital has exchanged hands. And for me, it's very critical because if you look at um, the ANC-led government post-94 and the Nationalist Party, starting with um, your Hendrik Verwoerd uh, and Dr. Bail, uh, Van der Bail, who was really the instigator for SOEs as champions of transformation for the African minority, you would then understand that with the African nationalist government, they were very protective of their SOEs. As much as the private sector could play uh, in that space, it was very limited. Hence, they were able to electrify the country and some part of the black community. And hence, they were able to industrialize. So they were able to nationalize and they were, they were unapologetic. Hence, it was important for British capitalism to find new partnership and to remove the apartheid government. Hence, I'm saying that if, if, if you look at the ANC now, and if you look at the National Party, at, at the Nationalist Party, when the Nationalist Party started uh, to be forceful to engage on issues of nationalization and to drive away the private sector, the English private sector, your Anglo-American, um, your BHP Billiton and other companies, uh, your Anglo, uh, your Anglo Val and others, when they started to drive them out of the SOEs, that's when 
the British started looking for new partners. That's when, you know, the English started to invest, mainly in the black majority. They invested uh, uh, in political parties. And what, what, is, what is quite interesting is that if you look at uh, the majority of the political parties, uh, pre-1994, they were actually funded by the British to fight this nationalist racist Afrikaner, which was racist in character, but nationalist. Um, so we are here where the English uh, companies, which have primarily benefited, which continued with your evergreen, uh, evergreen contracts, are now attacking the ANC led government that has allowed them space uh, to thrive, to prosper, and to monopolize. So it's just history repeating itself, and it's how we look at it. Now, for me, what, what would be interesting is whether the ANC itself is able to look at history and to be able to learn that big business does not have its interest at heart. And what should be its priorities to ensure that ESCOM goes back to the hands of the people, whether that is able to happen, um, it's another story. But another factor is the reality that if you look at the majority of the leaders within the ANC and the elites, the black elites, these are products of British handouts. These are people who were taken to school by your Oppenheimers, by your Clive Menels. I mean, if you look at the tenure of the Menel family and the scholarships and the buzzeries that they were able to create for your Cyril Ramaphosa, um, other institutions like the South African Council of Churches, which included your French Chicanis okay, of this world, uh, and many others. These are products of British scholarship. So whether they can win away and put the interest of their people at heart is another factor because the reality is that we are fighting a battle, we are fighting capital, which is able to prepare for the future, which invests for its future. And um, before I stop uh, in that, uh, for other questions, you would look at how British capital now is maneuvering. It is a well-known fact that now they are now funding the anti-Africa narrative, your illegal foreigners narrative, so that the majority of our people uh, now deviate from looking at uh, challenges facing the country, from looking at issues of the economy, or what is called the base, from looking at issues of the economy, issues of the land. Now we become distracted with your Zimbabweans, illegal Zimbabweans, uh, and so forth. So they are able to drive the narrative. They are well organized. They are well funded and they're very disciplined. Whereas with those who might be on the side of the people, on the left and progressive forces, uh, we're not organized, we're not disciplined, and we don't have the resources because, as you rightly said, I mean, in 2018, when we wrote or when we started compiling evidence about IPPs, we knew that what is happening now was going to happen. We went to the leaders that we thought were progressive to show them that the president of the country and his ministers were going to collapse ESCO. Unfortunately, no one listened to us. We were able to submit our complaint to the, pub to the then public protector, and we continuously receive communique from the current uh, office of the pub uh, public protector indicating that, yes, they are investigating. But if we were on the ground, if we were activists, because now what you need is active citizen, uh, citizenry. But over and above that, uh, sorry, I said I was closing. When we speak of your Anglo-Americans, I think what we don't also speak to be beyond the collapse of ESCOM is this uh, primary uh, energies, the ones which are collapsing ESCOM. We might speak of IPPs. Uh, we know that they want more IPPs uh, to ensure that uh, you know they continue to uh, privatize and money goes out of the country. But you take or pay where we are paying as taxpayers, where we continue to pay the same companies, uh, which are now speaking of green energy. So you've got this green economy, you've got the coal contract. So there are so many things that are happening in this country, and none of us uh, are organized 
to confront uh, uh, this uh, monopolies, to confront this historical uh, uh, um, capitalist, because they've been there. Yes. They have oh, no, just I, changed. I, you know, they've just changed just... the way that they're doing things. They've got new hosts, as I would call it, because they are parasitic in nature. Yes, uh, I think Papano is just uh, frozen a bit there. Uh, Rotendo, I think, you know, just uh, moving on from what Papano has said, and this is clear that there is a lot more at play than just uh, what we are being fed. Uh, I mean, the, like I said, it's become a moving target in terms of the excuses that have been given, but there are many underlying issues. And uh, the key issue here is, uh, you know, we hear about sabotage. Who is sabotage in the country? Who is sabotage in ESCOM? Uh, and uh, apart from this, uh, the big players, apart from the government, and we've been talking about the likes of Anglo-American, the Ruperts and all of that, but there is a huge uh, international interest in terms of what is taking place in South Africa, in terms of what they want to collapse, what they don't want to collapse. Do we need to industrialize? Do we de-industrialize? So all these issues are actually playing out in the background and one needs to understand this, uh, to, 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 to understand the real problem that this country is faced with. Yes, so first of all, you've got to understand the people that make money in the process. And you've got to understand that the monopolies that develop within the context of providing energy. And that's why I took the time to try and go back to try and make people understand. So you've got a couple of players that make money. You've got land speculators that make money or landlords that make money from what are called uh, way lease rights. So wherever you want to develop uh, uh, electricity cables, where you, wherever you want to put your pylons, wherever you want to put your cables that are going to carry your power and your power lines, they have to pay a certain amount of money to the landlords of the land, and that is called the way lease. You've got the bankers that make money by financing the power generation companies, by, buy, by giving them the money to be able to buy the machinery, the new technology, the land, uh, the coal, and all that they need and the inputs that they need in their uh, particular institution. So the banks themselves are generally Western. In South Africa, they are the uh, commercial banks together with the uh, uh, international banks that lend money to these SOEs. And so they've been a monopoly and they've been making money all these years funding ESCOM and being able to get paid by ESCOM. So it's not like ESCOM has ever defaulted for them to get to a point where they don't want to lend ESCOM any more money to expand. But there's also other monopolies. The guys that give you the machinery, they also are a monopoly. And these guys are making machinery for the current use of coal to generate power, but they're also beginning to change and they're beginning to evolve into the new green energy spheres. And they're being financed and some financiers are refusing to finance any technology that is not associated with the new green technology. You also have the power brokers and the people that broker the labor. They also make money. They're also a monopoly in skilling the people, recruiting the people, and labor, labor broking for the cheap labor that is going to go into that mining arena. They make money. But there's an area that many people haven't been looking at. And that area is on the transportation and the mining of the resources that are needed within power generation. And generally, the resources that are needed in power generation are coal, initially, which is provided by only six companies, all of which are not South African. They are international companies, and they're white. So you've got Anglo-America in there. Some people say Anglo-America is, is, is South African, but many of us believe it's actually a German-American company and not really a South African company. It was just domicile here while it was looting. And then we also see people like I see where we see companies like Rio Tinto, BHP, uh, Exaro, and uh, and and and, and uh, Kumba uh, together with uh, Sasso that controls 15% of all coal in South Africa. Although it doesn't use it for generation, it is used for, pro, for for creating fuel and diesel that also gets sold into that industry. Now, when you see these contracts, these contracts you've got 85% of all coal being provided by these six companies that I've told you about, and they are a monopoly, and they are white monopoly. And then the other smaller companies that are providing are also white, and only 4% of all coal and diesel and any other resources that are needed for the generation of electricity are actually coming from black companies, only 
So when people talk about corruption, the question we ask is, if evergreen contracts is how the fuel is being provided, is how the stationery is being provided, is how the coal is being provided, is how the parts and the machinery and the maintenance of the machinery is being provided by 96% white companies, who is the corrupt person in this particular equation? It's clearly those suppliers. It's clearly this white dominated supplier chain. When you go into the management of ESCOM, management of ESCOM is still predominantly white. But there's this impression that this it's been taken over by black people and the suppliers are now black. That's why ESCOM is collapsing. It's not true. Exaro hasn't been able to deliver some of its coal quotas. Same as Glencoe and same as other, other bigger companies there. And they have been hit by penalties by ESCOM for not supplying quality, for not supplying on time, and for not supplying the quotas. And when they've been hit by these penalties, they don't pay these penalties. They use their political links not to pay these penalties. They do not uh, honor some of their agreements. This is problematic and that is corruption, but it is not labeled as corruption. It is not publicized as corruption. We are not told about these particular supply glitches and low quality supply of coal. And this cannot be acceptable when most of the coal mines and that were that, that, that exist to give ESCOM power were actually funded by ESCOM itself because of agreements that were made within the, 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 the laws and the contracts that came from the apartheid era that gave rise to these evergreen contracts. So this is the corruption that we need to start questioning, that when they say corruption, who is corrupt? Because the face of corruption in South Africa has been made to be black, even though those black people control less than 4% of the contracts that come out in ESCOM. So how can people that get less than 4% of the contracts in ESCOM become the corruptors of ESCOM? How can uh, Tegeta or, or, or uh, the Guptas be the reason why ESCOM has started to collapse today uh, because of a contract that it got with a company that was only giving about 3% of the coal? So we need to start having these discussions. We need to start asking these questions because this is where the problem is. So these monopolies, the banking monopoly, which is very much influenced by Banks like Black, Black, Black Rock, Fidelity, Vanguard, State Street that control most of the banks in South Africa. They control most of the investment banks in South Africa. They control companies like Future Growth and Old Mutual that are the lenders into this banking system, into this finance of government. They are the ones that have started stopping giving the government of South Africa any funding, even though South Africa has never defaulted on any of its sovereign debt. And the question is, why would they refuse to give funding to the government of South Africa if those are not a form of economic sanctions, if that's not some form of an embargo on finance in order to break the state? And like uh, Papano said, this is a regime change agenda by the finances, by the English, and I want to say it's actually the English, Americans, and their European partners that are sabotaging this economy to keep it under the hegemony of Western control by putting in now what they want is a unity, a, a, a coalition government that's going to have the DA as part and parcel of that government, which will be a reinstitution of the apartheid order, if you ask me. So why are they not giving money to the South African government, which pays its debts? Why are they not giving money to South African parastatals that pay their debts? And it's not only ESCOM that's in this position. Every South African parastatal has been deni denied loans. It's been denied loans by the old mutual company, Future Growth, and the international players, including the Rothschilds. You've heard Mr. Kingston saying that they were going to join people like Future Growth not to give loans to South African SOEs because they are corrupt. But since when? They were corrupt since apartheid. They were perpetuating a crime against humanity under apartheid. That's the grossest form of, apart uh, of, of corruption that was rewarded by this very same capital, which kept putting money into the JSE, kept putting money into these private companies because they got their highest returns from South Africa. And they got their highest returns from South Africa because of the enslavement of black labor. They got their highest returns because of the killing of workers that didn't want to go to work. But now that the workers have got rights, now that the workers have to be paid a living wage, all of a sudden, these very same capitalists that were funding apartheid, crime against humanity, the grossest corruption, want to talk about corruption today, and yet they're still getting their money. So what corruption are they talking about, and why has it become a disadvantage to them, except the fact that 
it's become disadvantageous for them to do business in a democratic country that does not enslave people, that does not reap as much profits as they've reaped over the 120 years under apartheid that made them so fabulously rich. Well, thank you for that, Rotendo, and uh, to bring Papano back into the discussion. And uh, Papano, just listening to what Rotendo has been saying, uh, talking about what we can call a tailored narrative that is being sold uh, to the public and uh, the public are buying into the tailored narrative, but there is a reality check and uh, a lot that is taking place. In fact, Rotendo spoke about uh, the banking industry, the power of the banking industry. We know the power of the mining industry in uh, South Africa as well. And again, uh, looking at uh, these mining companies, many of them, we know Anglo-American had their base in South Africa. They moved over to the UK. We see very few of them actually channeling their profits back into South Africa, into infrastructure development, into the likes of ESCOM. And uh, when we talk about sabotage, the question is, who is the real, uh, uh, who is sabotaging whom? And that is a question I would pose to you as well, Papano. Oh, I'm, I think uh, Papano it seems to be having a bad line. Perhaps, Rutendo, you know, uh, while we're waiting for Papano to rejoin, uh, I see she is rejoining. Uh, Papano, uh, did you get my question? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I apologize. I'm, you know, good space, but load shedding is extremely bad here. No, but kindly repeat your question, please. Yes, Papano, the question about, you know, sabotage, and we've heard so much uh, where we've seen a tailored narrative uh, that comes through from the government on the troubles, and we've heard about the State Capture Commission, we've heard about Guptas, and now all of these people that have been sabotaging the South African economy. But just listening to what Rotendo had to say, he spoke about the banking industry, he spoke about the mining industry, and particularly these mining companies uh, and the banking industry refusing to fund South Africa, to grant loans to South Africa. But again, these mining companies have been all powerful. They've moved out of South Africa, they've taken the profit but they are not putting or channeling those profits back into South Africa to help the likes of our SOEs, to help the likes of uh, ESCOM. So there seems to be a deliberate move or a deliberate sabotage of some sort. No, um, thank you and, and apologies. I think um, my, my major challenge is we, we, we know all these things. Um, we know why the new narrative behind uh, sabotage, uh, the State Capture Commission, obviously. But I think uh, what is um, of great, uh, grave concern to me is that knowing all these things, we have not done anything. I mean, uh, uh, Rotendo spoke about the banks and the fact that the banks have made it clear that they're not prepared to fund coal-powered stations. So they've made it clear, but at the same time, they are the biggest this is a new Papano, uh, can I suggest that possibly you just switch off your video and be an audio so that possibly uh, we can improve the signal or the quality of the sound? Yes, hello. So what what is sorry apologies, what what is quite interesting? Is that the chairperson of the chairperson of ESCOM, the current chair of ESCOM, is actually also. Well, uh, we certainly are having a problem with Papano. Hopefully, uh, if she can stay on audio, uh, perhaps uh, she would uh, uh, come through a lot more clearer. Rotendo, uh, you know the the question I had raised to uh, to to Papano, and I'm sure you've heard what I have raised and uh, your comment. Yeah, well, what is interesting is Papan was just about to make the connection between the fact that the current chairperson of ESCOM is also sitting on as a, chair, as a chairperson or a board member within NetBank. And that surely is a conflict of interest because NetBank is the biggest funder of the renewable energy and the green energy that seeks to be trying to take away ESCOM's monopoly that was established by the, by the, by the uh, post-apartheid um, pre-apartheid uh, government that sought to grow South Africa. And she, she said, Vanderbilt was given the mandate 
to actually write a strategy on how it is that South Africa was going to be industrialized. And he said that the center of doing that was controlling the generation of power, giving power to all South Africans, and electrifying the entire railway network of South Africa. This would be able to industrialize South Africa and give them cheap electricity that would create industry. They know that. The people that are doing what they're doing now are part and parcel of the same logic that was developed by the Bruderbond and the governments uh, that, 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 that preceded the democratic governments. They knew that what develops uh, industrialization is cheap fuel, it's cheap LNG, it's cheap labor. And that is what they're breaking up right now by creating these new monopolies of this green energy, creating these small little fragmented companies that will sell power at a very uneconomic price to the government. And another thing that I forgot to talk about, don't forget the labor aspect. The labor aspect is a, still an apartheid desk labor, 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 labor relation where the white uh, 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 unions and the white labor brokers still want their workers to be the skilled labor. They want their people to be the engineers, the boiler makers who earn top dollar within ESCOM. But within that, they want black workers to be paid little so that their workers can be paid the most. And to a certain extent, they also want to keep out black workers from working in ESCOM. Hence this narrative that black people are incompetent, black people are black engineers are, are, are incapable of maintaining the fleet at ESCOM. And hence other people begin to talk about the fact that there is a possibility that the very same white engineers, the very same white workers who used to enjoy job preservation, are today sabotaging the plant, making it look as if the new black workers that are working within ESCOM are the people that are sabotaging it. But you must remember, a lot of the black workers that are in there, not all of them, but a great majority of them were actually poached from Zimbabwe by ESCOM because it had a shortage in South Africa when all the white engineers decided to resign from ESCOM to become consultants. The Zimbabweans came in and they've been able to run the ESCOM fleet all the way from the uh, from the late 80, uh, 90s up until now where we started having load shedding they're not new in escom they were able to maintain zesa in zimbabwe they were able to give power in zimbabwe they came to south africa they kept escom happening and even escom won awards in 2000 when there were some of these engineers within the institution all of a sudden and this is where you get people like Marcela coco he was part and parcel of that and all of a sudden today we are made to believe that these black engineers that have been there, that have been there when ESCOM was winning awards, all of a sudden become incompetent today at a time where there is an agenda to try and make it look like ESCOM is collapsing because of black people, when black people are still a majority in the management, they're a majority in engineering, and they're, I mean, sorry, they're a minority in management, the minority in engineering, they're a minority in service provision. So how is it that they can be responsible for what it is that is happening in ESCOM? And then we want to talk about this, um, revolving door policy where you have somebody coming from the banking sector that is a vested that is a, a conflict of interest with funding this parastatal and you ask yourself how can somebody coming from nedbank come and be a chairman of escom how will he keep escom going when his agenda at nedbank is to actually bring in private players and to destroy escom for those private players to come into the equation so these are the conflicts of interest we're talking about and even the decision makers in government themselves have vested interest because they've got players who want to come in and provide energy pro become independent service providers independent power providers and then the question is how then would government and its senior executive have an interest to maintain escom if they want escom to fail so that independent players come in but i would like to say to the government now remember that the boards were able to industrialize South Africa by having cheap fuel. If you bring in independent uh, uh, providers, you are not going to have cheap fuel. You might not even have efficient, uh, uh, you're not going to have cheap energy. And you might not even be able to provide efficient energy or enough baseload because as we can see, Europe today is dumping green energy. They're dumping uh, solar, they're dumping wind power back to coal which is why they're importing our coal in South Africa today. And another mess that we see, a lot of this coal that's leaving South Africa is not even South African coal. It is owned and controlled by the very same monopoly 
Western uh, mining companies that we spoke about. If you want to mine coal in South Africa, if you want to sell coal, you will never have a chance to sell it because you have to go to Singapore and apply at Anglo, Anglo, uh, at Anglo Coal. You have to go outside South Africa to the head offices that are outside this country and apply to be a coal supplier and you will never get a chance to do that. So it can't be called South African coal when it is controlled by companies that are not even domiciled here. Companies whose head offices that give you the permission to trade that coal are not even in South Africa. It is their coal. And the question that South Africa has got to ask itself is, is it not time to look at what the Boers did and start nationalizing? They nationalized the energy, uh, uh, the energy uh, uh, providers. They nationalized coal. So why don't we do the same? And once mm. they nationalize the energy provision and the energy creation, that's when you saw Anglo America, which was the former uh, British South Africa company that used to provide power, moving away from power generation into coal mining, into owning land so that they can have the, the, the way lease rights, into uh, 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 what you call it, uh, manufacturing. Uh, and this is what we need to start asking ourselves. Why don't we nationalize? Isn't it time to nationalize? Can we continue to have apartheid criminals? people that exploited the people of South Africa, people that murdered the people of South Africa. Anglo-America made the bullets and the tear gas that was used to kill South Africans when they protested in mines. They had private security companies that used to kill people so that for refusing to earn lower wages or for refusing uh, uncomfortable living conditions. Now we've got that very same company presiding over, influencing and transforming and, and sabotaging the economy in order for them to have power again to control power, to, to power generation, and to control the mining of the resources. That is a full spectrum domination of the country by private players who never had a good will for South Africa, and we have to do something about that. Well, Rotendo, uh, uh, you know what you're saying is very true because I often wondered the millions of tons of coal that uh, are leaving South Africa and Richards Bay uh, on a daily basis. We see so much, and uh, I always wondered, you know, where are those profits? Where is this money actually going to? And uh, makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, what you are saying as to, uh, you know, it is actually owned from outside the country. And that is the reason why uh, these profits are not channeled back into the uh, country. But also at the same time, when one looks at uh, the government and its position in giving us the narrative that it has, uh, the state capture narrative, the Gupta narrative, and all of this uh, appears to be a farce against what uh, you are actually saying. And uh, also, you know, talking about coal, uh, Madupi, uh, Kusile as well. And uh, it's a pity Papano is gone because she's put down a post with regard to the ESCOM files uh, about uh, the company called Hitachi and the money that they had paid uh, AMC as well. And we've seen the failure of what was supposed to be uh, our flagship power stations in this country. What, what is sad for me is that the focus is now being put on Hitachi, but Hitachi is not the only company that got contracts. There's an American company, there's, there's ABB that is that is there. And I think ABB was in, implicated in the uh, State Capture Commission as having received money uh, and procedurally. So there are a lot of players that were involved there, not just Hitachi. But whenever you see a company like Hitachi, which is a Japanese company, you have to understand that that is an American controlled company. So as I explained the history last time about the Morgan Pell plan, about the Marshall plan, Japan itself is a colony of the United States and part and parcel of what it is that their Potsdam agreement and the post-war agreement with Japan was that all its economy and its land will be occupied by American forces. But more critically, what many people didn't understand is Japanese ownership of its own economy was transformed by the creation of the stock exchange that took away the control of Japanese industry from the Japanese central bank and some of the Japanese uh, banks to, to the ownership by, by private players and particularly Americans and the British through the stock market. And so the stock market itself, if you actually go and look who controls Itachi? You're going to see BlackRock in there. You're going to see Vanguard. You're going to see State Street. You'll probably see Norges Bank. You'll probably see the big shadow banks of America that control almost 40% uh, of the global investment. And they have used their vulture funds to go and control companies across the world. So Hitachi itself is actually very much American owned as much as it is Japanese intellect that is behind it. And so this is the American uh, uh, attempt to colonize the world through military bases and capital.
And this is what we're seeing in South Africa, where American capital is infused into the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It uses the pensions of every South African and every government employee who is in the PIC. Their PIC invested investment is invested through investment companies that are partially controlled by the Americans, that have got cross-directorship of American companies and these big American shadow banks I'm talking about, which are then also in controlled by the American banking system or banks that have got American shareholders. So this cross-shareholding, this mesh of cross-directorships, cross-shareholdings, it's actually known as combines. These combines are the way that our country is now colonized today by what is called corporatocracy, which continues to be the means by which colonialism is taking place. And in South Africa, the British American, Anglo-American colonialism of our country, and I'm talking about Anglo-American on the company and corporate level, at uh, the company level, not the corporate level, which is then symbolized by the existence of a company called Anglo-America, is continuing to be the biggest scourge on South Africa. So we're still living the crime against the uh, humanity of colonialism and slavery in South Africa today under what it seems to be free trade globalization, which happens to be criminal in, in, as far as I'm concerned. Well, certainly, I see uh, we are obviously running out of time. The question is, you know, where to from here? How do we actually overcome uh, these issues, these challenges, uh, uh, the sabotage of, by corporate, sabotage by the outside world of the country? And uh, how does one actually challenge this? Because at the end of the day, uh, it is about uh, the scramble for not only South Africa, but the African continent as uh, a whole, uh, by all these countries, by the Western nations, by these corporates, uh, whether it's through the military industrial complex, uh, you know, whether it's uh, through the likes of Anglo-American, the banking industry, and all of this is impacting severely on the African continent. We've become deindustrialized. Uh, we can't produce uh, what we used to produce in the past as well. And things just seem to be going from bad to worse, Tendo. We, we, well, we, we first we have to unite. That's the first thing that has to happen. Africa has to unite. You cannot be 54 small little states that have no military capacity, no industrial capacity, no banks that it owns on its own because you're too small to be sustainable. We need to come together, then create critical mass that allows us to create the banks, allows us to create the industry. And Kwame Nkrumah wrote about this. Unity of Africa is the only way you can fight imperialism. Otherwise, Africa is going to be recolonized again. But more importantly, we need Africans to start being real. Right now, as we have this discussion, there are many people that are looking at me, looking at you and I having this discussion, saying you guys are talking about something dangerous that kills people. Ever since I made my video, everybody's saying that you're going to be killed. Everybody's saying you need to be careful. And the question I keep asking these people is, who is this person that you all fear is going to kill people who speak the truth only when they're speaking of a white monopoly, yet you say that state capture was done by Zuma and the Guptas, when yet you spoke freely without fear of death. Why are we scared of death when we once start speaking about white monopoly capital? Is it because that maybe they are the real state capturers? And if everybody fears this murdering and this death and assassination, then are they not a criminal enterprise, a criminal mafia that every South African, every African acknowledges the existence of the threat of death once you speak about these people, is it not time for us as Africans, as African governments, to then confront this criminal empire, this criminal mafia that everybody acknowledges? Now, many people say they are not just a criminal empire. There is the CIA in there, there's the MI6 in there, there's the Mossad in there, but all of those should not have the power to change laws and the power to do illegal things, the power to still undertake genocides in our country, still undertake extrajudicial killings like colonial governments. And we just look, we need to fight this. We need to use our parliaments. We need to use our law enforcement mechanisms. And we need to start fighting. The executives of these companies must be arrested. When people die after talking about them, some investigation must take place People must be investigated. People must be arrested. And the directors of these companies become complicit. If the owners can't be arrested, if the shareholders can't be arrested, then the directors must be arrested. And these companies must be shut down. Their properties must be confiscated. And they must be nationalized if they are going to be contrary to national interest. In the same way that the, 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 the government of Louis Borta, the government of Jan Smuts, 
decided that if you do not tell the lie in serving national interest, we have the right to expropriate. We have the right to nationalize. Why don't we have those laws as black Africans? Why doesn't the South African government today have laws to insist that if you are going to push us to privatize, then your private companies, if they're offering basic services, if they're offering services that determine the future of the nation and the existence of the nation, they have to deliver national interest, they have to deliver, make sure that they deliver to every citizen, they have to make sure that they deliver in the interest of the nation, and if they don't, they must be nationalized. I think that's where we have to go. People have to go radical. You cannot continue to have this criminal cabal that enslaved the people of South Africa, that stole all their wealth, that was financed by the state to create a lot of the assets that they have, but still rob the people. They do not bring the proceeds back to the people. And finally, remember that these mining companies were buying uh, uh, energy in South Africa. Uh, they were buying electricity at the cheapest rates in the world. They were being subsidized by the government of South Africa, but that is part and parcel of why uh, uh, I mean, part and parcel of why ESCOM is broke today is it was not collecting enough revenue to be able to have a replacement value tomorrow. We need to address that, and the, the South African government has to be radical, and it has to honour the interests of the public much more than the interests of a few capitalists and white capital, monopoly capital, Western capital, because that form of honoring a few over the plenty is colonialism back, colonialism 101. Well, uh, Rutendo Matinerare, I must say thank you very much for that and uh, for taking time out. And uh, I believe that, you know, we've uh, unpacked uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, I thank you for staying on and, uh, you know, throughout the entire hour and being part and parcel of this discussion right here on Salam Media. We wish you all the best and uh, please take care. Thank you so much. It's so sad that Papano couldn't share more of her wisdom. I was also learning a lot from her. Let's hope that we have another time to listen to what she's got to say. Well, hopefully at some point in time we will. But for now, once again, we wish you all the best. And uh, please be safe. Take care. Thank you. Rutendo Martinerare with us uh, this uh, evening. And uh, yes, uh, we need to apologize. Uh, Papano Pasha, unfortunately, uh, she had uh, connection issues. But uh, I'm sure we can try and get hold of her at some point in time. But uh, yes, uh, we unpacked uh, so much uh, uh, this evening. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, at some point in time, we will uh, visit some of these discussions from time to time. It's been most absorbing. But for now, I need to sign off from myself and the team. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.